On today, we get to continue with our series, What Does It Mean for Us to Enter into the Advent Conspiracy? My prayer is that you have been pricked in your heart, compelled to a great degree to enter the story with us. I want to start with this powerful scripture that I believe is just par for the course in Acts 20 and verse 35. He says these words, and Paul is speaking. He says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. Mm. He's speaking truth already. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. If I could do a little bit of churchology on this scripture, there's a powerful truth to the scripture and principle on, in this scripture that I think we miss. I think we get to the convicting part of it, which is it is more blessed to give than to receive, which kind of tells us in some kind of backhanded way, quit asking for stuff when you already bless with what you have. But I think the power of this scripture is not more than just a rebuke, but it's actually what it is assuming in the text. He says it is more blessed to give than to receive because the assumption of the scripture is that you have been blessed already. So when, he, when Paul is mentioning this, he says, God has blessed me to work hard to help others. And I encourage you to do the same because God has blessed me to be a blessing. So when you read the scripture, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes you feel like, oh, mean that, that means I can't ask for anything. I can't have anything. No, it means that God has set you up in such a way that you can be a blessing to people if you would extend your parameters of vision and you would begin to look at your blind spots in the world and see, I can actually be a blessing to this situation. So it is more blessed to give than receive also says that God has let you go through the valley enough to know the pain of others walking through that same valley. I oftentimes tell people I'll never understand how it is we are so forgetful of what we got through and what we went through to get to where we are. You know, it's amazing how when we were catching the bus, how grateful we were for God's blessings and how we prayed so earnestly. Now that we have a fleet of cars, we oftentimes judge people who are in the same predicament that we once were in. See, we have to go back and capture and re recapture some of our compassion. See, when we recapture some of our compassion, it means we start walking in the same shoes that other people who uh, are going through some of the same things we've gone through in their life. You know, shortage of food and shortage of goods and Christmas becomes a torment to their mind because they don't have all that it takes to make it look well. And, and yet you've been there. You've done that. You've gone through those phases. Some of you all, truthfully speaking, you're so done with the whole idea of Christmas that you've just tuned out the whole message of Christmas. And I think that's the programming of the world because we've been more tied to the American definition of Christmas than the biblical definition of Christmas. See, I want us to walk through this journey together, this journey of Advent conspiracy. I want you to thank you for letting me challenge the idea of Christmas in this season. Why? For this is the season that is not merely about accumulating more stuff, right? It's not about just putting a whole bunch of stuff on a list and seeing who's been naughty and who's been nice. But it, it is about, it, it, even it's not about gathering toys, right? And I'm not just talking to the children, I'm talking to the adult toys too. Right. We have our own adult toys. Don't, don't even trip. You don't even ask them to buy it. You go get it yourself. Right. Well, it's not about the accumulation of these things or even using this holiday season to justify getting something you would normally get. In its essence, Christmas was and is about changing the world. It's this amazing idea that God entered the pain of humanity through Jesus Christ and built a bridge for humanity to get back to God. It was about God changing the future of humanity. If we are to be true to this season, then we who are, who are followers of Jesus Christ are to seek how we can enter another's pain and change the future. See, if we truly are truly Christians, and this is not something that's stylish. This is not something we did because that's all our family has done. But if we really have the Holy Spirit in us and we really are convicted by God, and if we really love Jesus, then our Christmas season is about identifying pain and entering that story. Which means you cannot sit comfortably by and let the world pass you by as we wait for the crack in the sky for Jesus to call us home. On last week, for example, we partnered with the Crossing Church in Chesterfield and together we were able to bless the local Collinsville pantry with 4,600 pounds of food. Amen. Entering the pain. Entering the pain. Entering the pain of another person. 
seeing that there's a community that is looking for the church to be a light. And I see how your head and your mind is running right now. You're like, oh, oh, I got this. The church can help me. I would stop. Who are you helping? It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's not about you sizing up the church and what the church did for someone else. It's about you getting on board and saying, let's be one in thought. Let's be one in unity and in effort. And let's see how God blesses this particular cause and watch how God will bless you. Amen, somebody. We, this this 4,600 pounds of food will feed 80 families in the city of Collinsville. Listen, we've adopted a few more causes that I'm asking you to help us to enter the pain of. As you have heard me speak on for the past couple of weeks, there's a school in Zambia, Africa, for disabled children that the government discards and doesn't even acknowledge and won't let them get a free education because they consider them not worthy enough, not not able to get a return on the investment. So why invest the dollars? And I gave you that even on in that scenario, and we're going to produce, I'm going to be producing something that you can see on social media. So if you're not my friend on Facebook, go ahead and follow me because I'm kind of famous. (laughs) And so I want you to get a, a grasp of what we were able to see and the pain and the gravity of it because here's the deal it's, it takes literally uh, uh, $25 for those children to, to go to school for one complete year it's room and board, it's food, it's materials and one member and his family heard me give this story on last Sunday and, and they, they reached out to the church and says I want me and my family want to pay for one whole year from us to them that's something to actually congratulate about <laughs> Y'all like, what does it look like for us to go ahead and get two more years paid for? That 25 kids get to be a part of something great. That they don't have to wonder if this school will be able to carry them on for another year. See, let me be clear when we talk about these things. When we get into the pain of another person, it's not guilting you. It's not asking you to have what I'll call weak or poor pity. It's actually about the heart of Jesus Christ and what this season means. It's about something beyond your comfort zone and you saying, I want to enter this, not knowing all the details, not knowing what the results are going to be, but maybe I could be the ripple effect that causes something wonderfully revivalistic to happen. And let me be clear about this season that, that, that we're not saying that Christmas gift giving in families is bad. Okay. What we're saying is that Christmas is all about giving, right? It's all about giving. The question is, is your giving resembling what God's giving did? Essentially, is your giving changing the world? And you're like, oh, well, I mean, I can never compare with how Jesus gave. Actually, you can. You may not see the results of your gift. You may see, not see the results of your giving. But what you are is a part of a community that is consistently and effectively targeting areas that we can shine light in darkness. And over time, like seeds sown in the ground, over time, we will begin to see the ears of corn begin to protrude through the dirt. And over time, we will begin to see the seeds we planted become a garden and become a wonderful field that we can pull harvest from over time. Actually, gift, giving gifts is a great way to celebrate the birth of Jesus because in giving, we remember that God has given the gift of Jesus Christ to us. We, what we're saying is this, giving gifts to each other is good, but let's make sure that we're giving God gifts. Amen, somebody. God kind of gifts. God gifts to those in need. Not just a bunch of stuff like, because when we really think about it, does your cousin Harry need another sweater from Old Navy? That you're rushing in traffic to get just so that you can say, I got you something. How many more pairs of socks are you going to pass to people who you really didn't want to give a gift to? That's $25 if you get the right kind. I'm just saying. See, when we think about when we think about the waste of this season and the hustle and bustle of this season and stuff that we literally flush down the proverbial toilet of stewardship in order to appease someone on Christmas Day. Knowing that they're going to repurpose it. Or knowing that you're going to repurpose it. How many can be honest and say that you know people, you don't have to say it's you, that have a room of, or a closet of stuff that is repurposed stuff from Christmases ago? How many? How many can say that? 
About four of you all are honest. Thank God for you being honest. Everybody else will need to repent. (laughs) There are things we can do when we understand the burden of the gospel mandate. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. When the church embodies this, who can lay charge to the church? When the church of God gets beyond, shout me happy, run me around the church 17 17 and 15 times and give me some numerical, astrological numbers that will give me some connection to if I run around three, five or seven times, I'll get my miracle. And we get into this consumer driven worship where we have to get something out of it all the time instead of being empowered to do and be what God has called us to be and to do. What happens when the church gets there? I believe we have sat in comatose for so long that we're so used to receiving that we, un- we have forgotten what it looks like to be a dispensary and give. Yes, yes. And so ultimately our communities erode and people we could have sold into don't get the necessary uh, uh, resources they need and we don't reap a harvest from that seed. Yes. There are people right now who are waiting on you to enter their pain. There are people all around you, even sitting next to you, who are in pain and they are asking for the body of Christ to have eyes of Jesus and enter that story. Enter that story for what reason? Because God has blessed you. What do you mean he has blessed you? God has blessed you to come out of some dark nights. God has blessed you to overcome some insurmountable odds. God has blessed you to overcome with a bounce back anointing that made your haters start celebrating you. God has blessed you to overcome all kinds of depression and mental warfare that nobody else knows about. God has blessed you to leave a situation that almost got the best of you and you came out without the smell of fire in your clothes or in your hair. God has blessed you in your job where folk were trying to get you fired and what they levied against you actually got you promoted. God has blessed you. Do I have any witnesses in the house? God has blessed you to get approval where other folks said no at. Amen, somebody. God has blessed your proposal, your submission to be the one that was accepted when thousands of other applications were sent in. God raised your application to the top. You have been blessed. God has blessed you in ways that if I was to just sit here, we could have a whole Thanksgiving Day service just talking about how God has blessed you. And I'm thankful for the ways he's made. I'm thankful for how he blessed me with the stuff that I have. Listen, if we're honest, beyond the stuff I have, God has blessed you, your humanity, your weakness that qualified for judgment, that qualified for condemnation. God has blessed your humanity to come out of some bad situations. Situations and God has favored you, God has loved on you, God has set his seal on you, and no matter what has been done, God says, I still have a purpose for you, and I still got use for you, no matter how bad it was. Pick yourself up. God says, No, don't you do that. Let me pick you up, let me turn you around, let me set your feet on a solid ground. We are blessed. Can you just nudge your neighbor this morning and say, I'm blessed? And so are you. We're blessed. We're so blessed that God uses our imperfect selves to do some amazing things. We're so blessed. We're so blessed. We're so blessed that, that, that God sends resources at the right time. Not before, my God, not after, but listen, at the, my God, I feel right there. At the right time. God blesses us. I'm going to just stay in this vein here because I want to get us to understand that God is so strategic in your story. That he's compelled you by stretching you. Okay, some of y'all missed it right there. See, when you're about to give birth to something, expect stretch marks. Amen, somebody. See, when you're about to give birth to something, you have to expect expansion. It don't feel good. It makes you uncomfortable. You got nausea. You can't sleep because something on the inside is moving. God says, in order to get you prepared, I got to stretch you. Amen. You can gain some weight. You done got puffy under your eyes. You can't sleep like you used to sleep. But God says, if you just hold on, 
my God, you'll give birth to something and the, the birthing of it will make all the pain worth it. Do I got any mothers that can say amen to that? See, here's the power of that. So God is creating capacity. He's creating space so you can know how far you can stretch. You're blessed. You're so blessed right now. It's making the devil mad that he didn't devour you when he had the opportunity. I know you don't want to talk about that because you didn't said a few prayers, sang a few songs. You didn't did a whole bunch of dancing around church. And now you feel like you are uh, in Pharisee University. And I get it. You, you have forgotten that you forgot that you was an alternative high before you got to Pharisee University. Amen. Oh, okay, a few of y'all captured that. Yeah, you're using spiritual alternative high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got kicked out of everybody else's club. And God says, I'm going to let your, your spiritually remedial yourself get out of that situation. And I'm going to put you into a place and I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to bless you in spite of what everybody else said about you. We're blessed. We're highly blessed. See, when God gives us something, he gives us something that is amazing, that is, that is notable. He gives us you. And if I can make all of us understand the gift that we are, And that if you would quit living in your past, looking over your shoulder, like you have to give someone a litigation response to everything that ever happened in your past. Listen, if you got to keep reminding me of what was yesterday, I don't need you around me. I don't need your voice in my ears. I don't need you to have access to me because if Jesus forgave me, why do I need to keep asking for your approval? Can you check that out? Can you put me in heaven? No. Can you put me in here? Nope. Can you put me up? Nope. But you can show up, put me down. So I'm not even going to let you get that close to me. How many forgiven po- folk do I have in the house? All five of y'all. Praise the name of Jesus. The rest, I don't know what we're going to do with y'all. So then we got to start resembling our giving like God gave. So how did God give? The first way God gave is the gift of Jesus is profound. When we see how God gave, we see that the gift of Jesus was a profound gift. It wasn't some convenient gift. It wasn't some easy to give gift. It wasn't a quick stop at Old Navy gift. It wasn't a quick, it wasn't nothing quick. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't, it wasn't thoughtless. It was profound. And my brothers and sisters, essentially, when we give God kind of gifts, it also has a profound impact on who is the recipient. See, God gifts aren't minimal gifts. God gives on, oh, by the way, let me hurry up and get this done because I don't want them to be mad at me. I don't want them to look at me in a bad way. God gives, change the world. God gives, changes people's destiny. God kind of gives. I'll never forget it when we were just really struggling and trying to figure out what's next for this ministry. And, you know, we had bought a building from 80th, from uh, from Bar Avenue to 80th Street. We moved to 80th Street and we used every dime in our savings to get into that building. And this lady came into our life. She came into our life and she started hearing our story. She started seeing my passion and she started interviewing me. And I didn't know I was being interviewed. And so one day she came to me. She said, I'd like to invite you out to dinner, me and my husband. And so and so they did. And so I went to dinner and they said, we want to give you a seed check so you can hire hire your next hire and it wasn't no small stuff she wrote a check for fifty thousand dollars and says go find the person you need help that was back in 2008 she says you need help here we believe in you we had 35 people she said we believe in you see some of y'all are waiting for people to blow up and then bless them But when I needed you is when I didn't have no notoriety and I wasn't that skilled and I wasn't out front. I needed you to be an investor, a wise investor, a person that can see the potential and sow into potential. Just last week, I was with the same family just last week. And I was sitting down with that same family that sold that wonderful 50,000. I know some of y'all are like, well, they get that kind of money to church. So you've been missing your blessing. You've been missing your blessing. You've been missing your blessing. Here's the deal I'm going to tell you about. Sat down with them and they were like, you know what? We're so excited about your next step. We're so excited about what God's going to do. And when you get ready to let it all out, we're right there with you. We're proud of you. Through scars. They know, they know what I've been through. I don't have the perfect record. They know that I've had to go through some, some battles and some scars and some court appearances. And they say, we believe in you. Because the gift to me was not something that, that I qualified for. 
And that's what happens when we enter people's life. We enter their lives knowing they're not qualified, but we see a God moment in them. We see a God moment in them. See, when God, when we give God kind of gifts, it enters, we enter another person's pain and we volunteer to be used by God. Y'all remember the story of the prophet Samuel. He was in the house of Eli and Samuel started hearing some voices at night and would run into Eli and say, hey, I'm here. What you need? So after a few times, Eli recognized this young man was hearing from God. And he told Samuel, the next time you hear that voice, say, Lord, here am I. See, I want to just say that with some people. You've been hearing God nudge you to plug more into church and to give more of your resources to the kingdom of God. And God is saying your response needs to be in this season. Lord, here am I. Because the moment Samuel said, Lord, here am I, we got two books written about him by the powerful prophet's work. If he would have said, Lord, that's too much for me, that's the only thing we would have heard written about him. Some of us miss out on our next level because we tend to be cost effective with God, but we tend to be massive with our selfishness. We tend to say, I'm going to maximize what I want. I'm going to do what I need. I'm going to make my legacy big. I'm not going to enter the story of God. And I'm going to tell you, everything God has done to you up to this point is to set you up to be a greater utensil in the hands of God. Yeah, in the hands of God. The church could do more if the church understood the church. If the church understood what the church's purpose was to be and do, the church could change the world. But we're too busy wanting to receive. We're too busy wanting to get a word. We're too busy wanting to get the song that's going to take us out of depression every week. That we don't come to the place and to the table to say, like a good parent does, I'm going to let you eat first. My food may get cold or I may not eat. But if the children are taken care of, I'm happy and satisfied. We've got to get to the place where it's not about us. Is this challenging us this morning? I pray it is. Because it's got to be this bigger story than just about us. It's got to be bigger than us just getting the house or just getting the new car. It's got to be bigger than us getting the flossing job with the corner office. I'm not saying those things are bad, but I think we've made Christianity all about that. We've made prayers all about that. And we have walked by what we should be entering the story of people in pain. The Christmas scene, it's all about pain. When you go back to the manger, it's about God giving a solution to pain. It's about God giving a solution to pain. It's about God showing us he isn't far off. Instead, he's right close to us. In fact, I want to look at Matthew 1 and 23. It says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which is what? See, it's about God entering our narrative. It's about God showing us that he's not far away. It's about God showing us he is with us. Did y'all hear that? All of the earth in you should have shaken. Jesus is God with us. So here's the powerful truth of this. When sin entered in the Garden of Eden, the break between God and man was so severe That God had to prepare a special solution. What Adam failed to do, what Noah and the ark could not do, what Abraham was incapable of doing, what the feast and the Sabbaths could not do, what Samson and the judges could not do, what the laws could not do, what King David or Solomon's wisdom could not do. In Jesus Christ, he became the answer to all of those failed institutions and personalities. What they could not do, Jesus did. That ought to make the child of God in you shout a little bit. See, only God could connect us back to himself authentically. And that happened through Jesus. And this is what you need to understand. In John 1 and 14, it says, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. One theologian translate verse 14 this way. And God came in Jesus and moved into the neighborhood. 
See, when we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, that's such a profound gift that God says, I'm not just going to talk what y'all should do. I'm not just going to give y'all laws. I'm not just going to give y'all precepts and principles. I'm not just going to tell you all the standard, but I'm going to enter the story. I'm going to wrap myself in flesh. I'm going to come through 42 generations through a virgin and a disqualified lineage, the lineage of David, and I'm going to prove to people, I'm going to show them that even Rahab gets redemption through Jesus Christ. Here's the powerful truth of this. This is so hope giving because we have a savior who gets it. Check it out. Verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that means he feels our pain. He sees and knows the depth of our struggle. He fought the same temptations and struggles we all face. He knows the burden of holiness in the midst of messiness. Look what Hebrews 4 and verse 15 and 16 says. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do. Come on, somebody say, I do. (laughs) Make it personal. He faced everything you face. Yet he did not sin. Verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive judgment and condemnation to condemn us forever to hell. There we will receive mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Okay, okay. The preacher in me want to shout right here. The re- preacher in me want to shout right here and I want to literally just act the fool with this scripture. Because the power of the scripture says we have a savior who understands our pain. He walked the same, he walked the same roads that other humans have walked. He he dealt with the same variances that humans have dealt with. He he dealt with being empty and lonely, betrayed and depressed. He he dealt with being hungry and needing help. He dealt with how weak we are. So when I come to Jesus, I don't have to explain to him nothing. He says from heaven, I get it, baby. I get it, son. I've been where you've been. I've seen what you've seen. i felt what you felt. And I had something in me that gave me the power to say no. And I'm going to give something to you that will give you the power to say no. And when you don't say no and you still do wrong, he says, get yourself back up. Go back to the throne of grace and find some mercy to help you when you need it. I want to talk to those who are struggling this morning. I want to talk to those who are in a battle this morning. I want to talk to those who messed up real bad this morning that we have a savior that understands. He ain't judging you like this. He ain't knocking you down like that. But he's saying, come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He he says from heaven, I am the balm in Gilead. Come to me. I'll bless you. I'll lift you. I'll restore you. Because he understands our weaknesses. I know only a few of y'all go get this because some of us are so tuned into our weaknesses that it has caused us to stop moving with God because you think that you're such a disappointment to God because of this weakness and God says no you're not. I made a way for you. Check it out. Hebrews 2 and 14 says it this way because God's children are human beings. Pause. Notice he didn't say because God's children are mighty angels. Notice it didn't say because God's children are superhuman. Notice it didn't say because God's children are unearthly. They have come from another planet. He says because God knows his children are human beings made of flesh and blood. The son also became flesh and blood for only as a human being could he die. I feel my, I feel the blood of Jesus sermons kicking all right here. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. That's Easter for y'all who don't know. Who had the power, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. When you come in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you don't have to look like death. You don't have to look at death as a final chapter. 
I know it hurts when loved ones go on before us, but I will see them again. I will meet them again. They ain't got to worry about any more doctor's appointments, any more needle sticks. They ain't got to worry about any more medicine, any more high blood pressure, any more diabetes. I will see them again. I know that's not comfort for some of y'all right now, but I'm here to tell you one glad morning. When this life is over, grieve for me on this earth, but I'm already translated to heaven, walking with God, talking to my father in heaven and my father who was on earth. See, it says we, we, God knows your stature. He knows you're not superhuman. He knows you miss it. He knows you mess up more often than you actually get it right. He says, come to me. I came in the same flesh suit you have on today. Temperamental suit. Even Jesus got angry. He says, I get it. You, you, you angry. He threw over tables. He told Peter, you, you, Peter, you're dumb. He just basically said it in modern day. He, Peter, you're dumb. You, you've been with me all this time and you don't get nothing I tell you. You're just dumb. I, he, he, he got mad. He, he, he showed us that he knows what it feels like to be us. Can I give you one more, one more perspective on that? Because some of y'all are dealing with some deep pain. You don't talk about that pain, it's silent pain. You're trying, you're, you're trying to treat that pain with over-the-counter medications. You're trying to somehow get a few people to just affirm you every five minutes because you feel that if they affirm you, that'll fill the void of loneliness on the inside of you. Some of you all feel like you are a captive in your own situation. You try to smile through it, but you really can't keep the smile going because inside you're being tormented. Some of you right now are dealing with some dark chapters and you're trying to let everybody know it's okay. It's okay. I got this and that going on and this and that going on and this and that going on. It's okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything is well. And so we post to keep people from getting too close. We give pictures of our happiness to keep people away from our sadness. We give the impression that all is well because we don't want anyone to enter our pain because we think our pain is not redeemable. We're in something that maybe we, 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 we even say it. We, we get real, we get real, uh, what's the word here? We, we get ownership happy of our pain. Because we start saying, I did this wrong, I did this wrong, I did this wrong, and then this is what we conclude, I deserve this. And so I'm going to live the rest of my life out under the auspices of this pain, which is also known as shame and condemnation. I just believe that everyone Jesus encountered, he was speaking to us today. The one with the issue of blood for 12 years, he's saying, I get it. You've been living in private pain. Nobody could help you. No one could give you a prescription to help you. You spent all your money. You talked to all kinds of helpers. No one could help you. And the woman, he gives us this powerful move she makes. But he's saying to all who are here of the female species, when there's private pain, I get it. When the blind man says, the blind man, the son of Bartimaeus, Timaeus, when he is there trying to get an answer, he says, man, I get it. You are a leader, but you are blind. You can't see the next step. I'm going to let you see. I'm going to enter your pain. I'm going to make you whole. And that's the power of Jesus and the profundity of his gift to us. He gets it. Have y'all ever spoke to someone about something that you just was afraid to talk to other people about and you said after the phone call, they get it. See, there are some folk who are observing you, waiting for you to fail, and Jesus is observing you and he's from heaven saying, get back up, get back up, get, get back up, come get, I, I'm, I'm cheering you on. I, I want to talk to everyone here that has given up and you are still operating as business as usual and you were doing a whole lot of activity but in your core you are dying you're disintegrating you're ready to just flip out and lose all control this is your moment to just be that messy person that others have been and they were not given many consequences you're saying this is your moment I'm saying no it isn't because we have a savior who understands our weaknesses and he's saying to you daughter he's saying to you son I get it, and I've given myself to you. I've entered your pain. This is where incarnation, which means he wraps himself in flesh. Jesus could have came as a mighty angel. 
He could have came with chariots of fire from heaven. He comes through a virgin who is not from the most wealthy family. Who's right now being a little bit suspicious if that's really Joseph's child or not. So they literally got a Mari Povich moment going on. Who's the father? He's born in a manger because no one gave him space in the inn. Check it out. It's raining. If you read the text, a manger is a place a lot of animals lived in. And if y'all have ever been around animals, they don't say, excuse me, I need to go to the bathroom. Wherever they dwell, they defecate. The manger wasn't a cute space. It wasn't a nice, neat space. It was full of mess. And that is where Jesus is born. And if y'all have ever been at a hearth stable and you have ever caught the scent of mess, it will awaken you. Jesus was born in the midst of mess. Can I stop and say this word? If you could just keep going. Here's the power of that. Here's the power of that. Which means there's no mess you've ever been in that he don't understand. Now, this is the message that's going to help you for, ne- for the next whole year. There's no mess you've been in that he don't get. He knows the smell of mess. He knows the scent of mess. He knows the deepness of mess. Imagine that Mary giving birth to Jesus and Joseph standing on the side of her waiting for the baby boy to come through. And he's standing in manure and mud and rain with animals around. His earthly father understands mess, but Jesus understands it more than his earthly father. Could you imagine, if you would for a moment, the blessed profoundness of the gift of Jesus, that when he comes into our life, he's not coming to a neat spot that's prepared. Because truth be told, most of us didn't have space for him. That's why he waited for the manger moment of our lives. Because the manger moment, see, the inn was prepared for guests. The manger was prepared for animals. You don't go and clean up the manger per se. See, Jesus had to wait for the mess of your life to become the only place he could meet you at. And I want to just remind you who are here today, before you lose it, can I tell y'all some inspirational stuff? Be the gift that God called you to be. Be the gift that God called you. You know why you're getting hit so hard? Because the enemy never wants you to come into the gift God called you to be. You know why people and the enemy constantly remind you of what you did wrong? Because the enemy does not want you to be a gift that enters somebody else's pain. Your weakness is actually a testament to God's greatness. None of us qualify for God's blessings or his usage of us. He enters our mess, which leads me to this last point. The gift of Jesus is costly. When God gave us Jesus Christ, it cost him something. And any time a gift is going to help someone out of their pain, it's going to cost you. Let me just give you this scenario real quickly, and I'm done. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Magi. Can I tell you all where they come from? came from the east. Can I tell y'all where? Y'all remember we did this whole story and series on Daniel? Y'all remember how Daniel was such a powerful testament that he began to institute Yahweh and the knowledge of Yahweh into the Babylonian culture? This is the results of 600 years ago of evangelism. These folk came because Daniel stood up for God. They were expecting the Savior because Daniel told them about one who was coming. And if God can use magi who are watching stars to guide them to Jesus, 
God can use the hood to get you to him. God can use the mistakes of your life to get you to him. They came because one man decided to stand up in a heathenist culture. He decided to worship no matter what the culture around him was doing. And the last thing it says, and going into the house, the only reason they went into the house was because something special was on the inside. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. And what did they do? He said, you're the one Daniel told us about that was passed down from generation to generation for six centuries. They bowed down and worshipped. That word worship means to kiss. They bowed down and they worshipped. Check this out. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh they offered him gold and frankincense and myrrh gold is one of the most expensive metals in the earth gold is the thing that our money system is tied to or used to be tied to but gold represented the power of wealth and the power of a king did they know what they were doing no but they knew if we were going to get to Jesus and worship him it was going to cost us something They gave him frankincense. It was used in temple worship. It represents the deity of Christ. He was truly born, God in the flesh. And myrrh is a perfume they used when one died. It would give off a scent to mitigate the decaying body smell. Theologians give us this idea that 75 pounds of myrrh is used and other spices when they're going through Jewish ritual, burial rituals. 75 pounds. They predicted his death. They predicted his kingship. They predicted his deity. And it cost them to travel hundreds of miles by camel to meet Jesus. Can can I for a moment just say these few words? They found their way by consulting scripture. They said, we know he's going to be born somewhere in Israel. They consulted scripture. They they gave themselves in worship when they found him. And then they gave gifts. Y'all catch that? They found him following scripture. Powerful truth. They gave themselves in worship. And then they gave gifts. Can I tell you all what it means to give more? It means we find him in scripture. We worship him when we find him. And we give of ourselves. Can we stand all over the house?